Greetings and welcome to this tonight's Nyrsa Readings. My name is Barbara Krasnoff. I am going to be your host for this evening. And we are going to be talking to and listening to Karen Hewler, who has a great new book out called The Splendid City. But before that, um, I have a couple of announcements. First, Yourself is for the present remaining virtual, although we hope to change that as soon as it's practical. We will be here monthly, usually on the first Tuesday of every month, and will be accessible both on Facebook and on Jim Freund's YouTube channel. While we miss meeting you all in person, the advantage is that we can present authors who are not in the New York City area. And while we don't have a confirmed booking for August, our guest on September 6th will be Sarah Langan. So we're looking forward to that. Now, and now let me introduce Karen Hewler. Karen Hewler is a literary sci-fi fantasy author. Her stories have appeared in over a hundred literary and speculative magazines and anthologies such as Conjunctions to Tin House and Weird Tales. She has received an O. Henry Award, been a finalist for the Iowa Short Fiction Award, the Bellwether Prize for Fiction, and the Shirley Jackson Award for Short Fiction, among others. She has published four novels, four story collections, and a novella. She also teaches fiction writing at NYU School of Professional Studies. And I now it is my Great pleasure to announce and introduce Karen Hewler. Hey, Karen. Hi, Barbara. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm looking forward to it. I just want to check because you were breaking up talking. Am I coming through clearly? Um, you're breaking up slightly, but I, I can hear you. Okay. Um, well, well, Karen, I guess before I should you go ahead, see what happens. Yeah, well, I, I guess right now I think we'll just keep going and hope. Hopefully, things will clarify themselves. Um, before you do your reading, um, can you tell us a little bit about your new novel and how it came to be written? Um, it's called The Splendid City, and it's a novel about two main characters. One is um, Eleanor, who finds out that she has the properties of a witch, so she is discovered by other witches in a coven in New York City and invited to join them as she goes through training because she has to learn the rules. Um, one of which, for example, in the transformations, well, you have to remember put in the key to unlock the spell and uh, she's working at a gift shop with someone called Sin, who's uh, a co-worker at first he gets a ring but he's obnoxious bullying a bit of a stalker he's always on her case and he does something at one point where she automatically changes him into a cat without thinking and forgets to put it to unlock the spell. She, Coven, the head of the, the Coven is Gloria. Uh, the Coven sentences the two together since they're mutually involved in shenanigans. Uh, sends them both to Liberty. Liberty used to be Texas. It broke away and seceded and declared itself its own republic, uh, state, Empire, what uh, is led by a president who used that entertainment is the key keeping everybody from revolting. So he's certainly got parades, he's got giveaways, there were showers of nougats. He did everything he can to distract people. Um, but uh, Eleanor is given the charge to find a message, and Stan is supposed to learn to behave better. And they have this task before they can be restored to their former life again by that's but, basically it it's it's light and funny 
Yes, it's it's uh, it's actually I, I love the book and I love its 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 tone. Um how how did it come to be written? I mean, you know, did you did is this something that you'd been well, thinking about for a while? No, new things actually sort of came. Stan, Stan the Cat and the opening couple of pages I wrote a while ago, years ago. Um, and uh, Stan the Cat is basically my homage to Mikhail Bunikov's The Master and Margarita, which is a book that I absolutely adore, that I read in the late 60s. In it, uh, the devil comes to Moscow. One of the devil's companions is a big black cat called Behima, who has a bow tie and is wielding a gun in the team. 67 or 8 version of it of the cover it's one of the benchmarks for me um i i loved magic realism the audacity of the things that bulgakov got away with um the way you could try anything you wanted in a i think is what really put my attention and the things they tried have to be the kinds of things I adore it worked out well um my first kitten matter of fact my first black kitten I named behemoth That's the name of the black cat in the book and I just love that black and when I wrote this first I'd say at least five years ago um the character was called behemoth because it's a very delicious deliberate homage a number of different scenes really reflect back on scenes like in the master and margarita so originally uh, stan was called behemoth and it took place um it didn't have a place yet in the after the 2016 election however it became clear to me the place was and uh a lot of liberty is based on what I saw as the willingness of people to accept lies uh, if they're entertained by them. So that in itself is a, a basic reflection on what I saw happening in the United States. And the first version of the book had my more specific allusions to what was happening in the United States along the border, for instance. And is uh, someone, one of the editors who read it pointed out that it was too topical. It had mm -hmm. an expiration mm -hmm. date. Eventually, a lot, a, lot of, a lot of my references would no, uh, would seem terribly out of date. So I went back and I rewrote the first half or half of the book and this is the version that uh we ended up with and i happen to love that i love the the craziness of liberty in this version the the, the way it's a constant feeling of excitement in that you know in that in that city and how it arrives on it and it doesn't matter if there's vans called messengers that go screaming down the street and occasionally it will stop in a brand new car or some sort of uh, extravagant gift, but occasionally it stops and takes someone away. Mm -hmm. Nobody really cares that it occasionally takes someone away. Oh, they're all sure it's to a marvelous vacation. Fact of the matter is because they're getting something that they out of it, it doesn't matter who is affected by it. And they, so that's liberty for me. And it was a lot of what I watched. And yeah. Uh, I hope we never see that again, <laughs> but that kind of <laughs> Okay. Um, well, bef before we go further into the novel, why don't, um, why don't we have you read us a little bit of it? Uh, so I should go ahead and read? Yeah. Okay. I see we're both a little, so um, I'm going to go ahead and read. And I'll try to read slowly. Chapter one, Liberty. Betsy Bundaroo was used to seeing cats, not ones who walked upright or spoke. 
standing at the bus stop reading the notice that said the bus had canceled permanently. Why, she wondered. Why don't they say? But these were the times, indefinite suspense, removals, reversals, etc. Suddenly were, and then justice suddenly were not. The church is breaking down, she thought, and no surprise there. The sort of grim satisfaction in it. So it already changed since the election. Why not do? Why should anything work when none of it made sense? The president did not want buses to run into palace, and that was necessary, she supposed. She understood. But the larger problem was that the world was going crazy. No one could tolerate anyone who didn't agree with them. It's true, the big black cat nodding wisely. Ah, uh, she had been muttering again, a bad habit that was growing on her. The cat was wearing a bow tie and a fanny pack. I'm finding it very hard to have a comfortable conversation these days. Every about sound bites and no one shouts facts. I wonder if there are any facts, she said with a sigh. I mean, everything is endlessly manipulated. If she'd had time, she, she would have wondered why she was ha having a conversation with him. But right then and there, she felt it was best to be polite because he was such a very large cat, sounded irritated. Things would be so much better if there were no internet, the cat link, because it spreads everything fast. People see crap, believe it, and act on it before there's a ch chance to respond. And there's never just one response. It branches out. Have you heard about mushrooms whose underground roots spread out for miles in all directions? That's the internet for you. But mushroom roots aren't right or wrong. Wrong, she said, I don't think you've got quite the right kind of analogy there. Really? He asked with a nasty hissing kind of snarl, pulling off his fanny pack and rummaging through it quickly to pull out a... Really? He asked again. Got her. She clutched her upper arm. Blood ran through her clothes. The cat put the gun back and ran off. Eleanor was going to... A happy growl rose in his throat. Uh, Stan the cat continues on his way at a cafe. The cat was licking his whiskers clean of cream, taking long, furious swipes with his paw, and then running his tongue at He felt very good about himself, which is most of the time, but especially true at times like this. Eleanor believed in simple food. He was more of a gourmand, notwithstanding the whole mouse thing. He leaned back against the seat, going around with a superior, satisfied eye. He caught a type of exasperation in a couple of nearby and changed his seat after the setting sun was in his eyes. He loved to eat up. It was an art, and he, he was an artist. He also loved to take whatever provocative statements and put, to, put them and post them to whispers, find a Twitter thread that paid out for the world with the highest engagement. He had been surprised to find that, that Liberty had nothing like this social network when he arrived, and so he had started it. That was one reason he actually enjoyed being here. It was technically underdeveloped country. Eleanor might change him here, but he loved it. The tents cut themselves politely apart, though the woman in particular trying to appear casual and contained. It was clear that discussion was on its way to being an argument. The man leaned forward. When you picture America, what do you see, he asked. I mean, what's the image you have? What I have? It's a man in a field working on his crop, standing tall to see his work, or a steel girder, or looking at his act architectural, or on a commuter train going home to his family, or defending his country in uniform. And them are Asian or Arabic or, or even black or Hispanic white men. The woman's smile was slow, chilling. I think it's interesting too how it's always men you see when you think of Americans. Do that. You know what I mean. Anyone says men, they include women in it. Stan could hardly keep himself from cheering. Of this kind of thing. Really? 
hand slowly curled itself up. Do they ever sin and include men? Would you stand for that? You're just deliberately turning it around. I mean, only that when you say Africa, you think blacks. When you go, you see Puerto Ricans. When you say a country, you see people live in that country. And, and it's good. When you go to India or Africa, if it was just like going to Herbs, no difference. All I'm saying is differences matter. They have value. They have. And when I see America, I see, yes, white middle class man in the picture of what this country was for. When it was stolen from the red man, yes, the red woman, either, which again is very interesting. The man groaned in annoyance. This is an unpleasant part of your person. You're too stubborn. You're ref refusing to argue the merits of the case. You're just falling back on feminist crap, feminist martyr crap. You know, they do studies on what causes heart attacks and what to prevent them, to treat them. And you know what? They only studied white men. And it turns out the signs aren't even the same for men and for women. When women went to the ER, they were turned away because the symptoms didn't match the symptoms for a man's heart attack. They went home with their heart attacks because... Whenever they studied something, they studied it with the male in mind, whether it's medicine or, or, or geography, apparently. Again, I see your point, and that's a case to think about, I'm sure, but it's not typical. It is typical, and it's time we did studies of all diseases but used only women. Let's see what happens then. That's stupid. That's just so stupid. How could it possibly be right, a study like that? How could it possibly be right if there are no men in it? Women and men are not the same. There. You see, you know that, and you're not particularly enlightened. But medicine didn't know it. Isn't that amazing? You have to start with the male, he said. Of course you do. I mean, how could it possibly be valid if you started with women? Men don't have that whole menstrual thing, those, those hormones. They don't get pregnant. None of that stuff. Of course it wouldn't work. The baseline has to be male. Why? He spluttered. You're doing it again. You're being stubborn. I don't know how to say it without getting you mad. Penises. Is that what you mean? It can't be valid if it doesn't include a penis? He sighed dramatically. It really took you that long to get to it. Everyone knows it. The penis is the dynamic force of civilization. There. You wanted me to say it. Now I did. If it doesn't have a penis, it can't matter. What else? Penis has made the world the way it is. That's true, she said bitterly. Look around you. Walls, polluted water, forced marches. Keep your voice down. They glanced quickly around the cafe and their eyes settled together on the cat. What's that? She whispered. Stan had excellent hearing. It was ridiculous how people thought he couldn't hear what they were saying. Maybe they thought he spoke a different language. He grinned and turned it into a yawn, then waved at the couple whose enmity had been overcome by their uneasiness. It's a cat, the man said, or something like a cat. Should I, Stan wondered, and then shrugged. I am a cat, he said grandly. That would unsettle them on so many levels. If the cat could talk, they would wonder, could it report their conversation? Their faces went through contortions, trying to remember all the things they'd said. Let's go, the woman said. The man took out a credit card. In cash, she hissed. Cash, they glanced again at Stan. I don't have enough, the man said, but the woman was already going through her pockets. She took out a bill and put it down. Now, she said, let's go. He nodded and they stood up quickly, keeping their eyes straight ahead as they passed Stan. What a good day this has been, Stan thought with satisfaction as he wrote down a question for his new and thriving whispers feed. Which is more typical of the human race, a man or a woman? That would get them going. He really should reward himself. A delicious cream tart? Should I have a second? He considered seriously whether a second cream tart would be against his principles. It would not. After Stan returns home, he annoys Eleanor as usual. Eleanor opened up the pantry door, bent down, and picked up a cardboard box. Stan groaned. Not the box. Not right now. But she ignored him, took a step into the next room, and put the box down. He had no choice. 
Try as he would to ignore it, it kept calling to him. Would he fit exactly? Would the fat, fat around his middle spill over the sides? Would he tuck his feet in so neatly that he looked like a loaf still in his pan? Sitting in boxes was so comforting and life affirming that he had to promise himself he would only sit in it for a moment and then go up about his business finding the treasure. He stepped in and sat. There was no longer any reason to move anywhere else. Eleanor looked at him with contempt. For all his superior airs, he still couldn't resist a box. How must that feel, being un unable to resist? Lured by one's own nature, abandoning reason. She was sure it felt like any other impulse, obsession, or quite frankly, knee-jerk reaction. She knew a lot about those. She was often trapped by a reaction just as a cat was trapped by a box, presumably. It was just in their nature. She felt a little mean, of course, but it was better than using the laser, which she couldn't resist and always had to chase. He would scold her, insult her, and still he couldn't resist chasing it. Doing that to him had started to feel shameful and she had stopped, but the box, how could that be torture? It just kept him quiet for a while and that was good for the peace of the entire universe. She was sure of it. She left him there for the night. Eleanor uh, is walking down the city one day. Eleanor got used to seeing the president's animatronic head in various places all over the city within a week or two of her arrival. It was out in the open in the parks and plazas, and she came upon them near churches, stores, ATMs. She had asked a perfect stranger what they were for and been given an odd, appraising look and a quick new in town. Yes, this is our president. I understand, but why heads? Why so many? He loves us and he's everywhere for us. He's always available when we need him. It's a great comfort and solace. I don't know if he'll listen to you though, as an outsider, I mean. The stranger started to walk off and then turned. I hope not, he said, he's ours. She had seen people walk up to the heads, huddle close, and whisper. Like a confessional, she thought. By the second week, when she saw a woman step back from a head halfway down the block, she felt a tug of curiosity. Was there a man behind the machine? Was it a recording? How did it work? She approached it and stood, waiting. What do you want? The head said amiably. Is there anything you would change? The head sat on a platter ruffled with green silk. The face was an, was an idealized version of the president's face, smoother, friendlier, though of course the president always seemed to be friendly. His eyes blinked and changed focus and followed her as she moved. It was uncanny. She looked at the head skeptically, trying to analyze why it had such a bland expression, yet provoked such an annoying reaction. It blinked its eyes and its gaze followed her as she circled it. All right, she said finally. Hello, it nodded. How are you? Fine, thanks. She rolled her eyes at herself. Really, should she thank a computer or recording or whatever this was? Are you better than you were? The question unexpectedly stunned her. Was she better? She was not at peace with herself, certainly, but she was going forward. She had done something she shouldn't have done, even it was to a person who should have had it done to him. That was confusing. Was she saying that the action was itself justified, but she was not justified in doing it? That kept spinning out in different directions because looked at objectively, if the action was right, then the actor was right. Wasn't that so? How could the action be right and the actor wrong? Still, she admitted, logically or not, that she shouldn't have done it. Would she do it again if pushed that far? She hoped that she had improved, gotten better, had more control over her actions, her temper, her responses, her instinct. Her instinct sometimes lashed out. And it was confusing that the other witch had said that this impulsiveness, wrongness, was something she hoped to use to find the missing witch. So in this case, a wrong action for a right end. And she wasn't like that all the time anyway. She had made one mistake, one huge mistake, 
that was also true that she had always avoided people because they annoyed her. They were not like she was, and they had always noticed she was not like they were. Was she any better now? Head was patient. The head allowed her to think. She was looking for a missing witch. She was living with the cat and hadn't killed him or thrown him across the room. In fact, they went their separate ways and had made a kind of accommodation with each other. That was something. She recognized that what she had done to the cat was wrong. She should have done something that didn't jeopardize the witches. She straightened up her head. Yes, I'm better. Not perfect, but better. She felt relieved that she could say it. I knew it, the head said. I've done all I could to improve the life of the people I serve, and I'm gratified to know that I have helped you in whatever way I could. You didn't help me, she snapped. I helped myself. We all work together under my administration to improve the people's lives, working together to get rid of greed and hypocrisy. Greed is your ruin. Give to my campaign as a token of your dedication to the abolition of greed. Will you give a small donation now to spearhead our campaign for greater liberty? The head grinned and waited for her answer. A small shelf came out with a touchscreen for a credit card. After two minutes of silence, it discreetly withdrew. The head made no mention of it, but instead continued. Our greatness relies on our ability to move forward together in humility and loyalty. Of course, not everyone is loyal, and that, and that's a danger to our democracy. Maybe you know people who are struggling with this and you would like to do something to help them move forward with us and with us, with you and with us. A moment's pause. The best thing you can do to help them is to tell us who they are. We'll reach out to them. We'll send specialists to help them love our great democracy. Sometimes people just need a little kindness to, to discover how great we can be together. They're probably unhappy too. Don't they seem unfulfilled? Tell us, tell us and we'll help them. She stepped back. She was horrified. A little bit of light lit up the head's left eye. Was it a flash or was it a reflection? She looked around. It was a bright day. There were cars and birds and anything could have made a shadow or a reflection, but she felt uneasy, terribly uneasy. She stepped back and then stepped away. Remember, we love you, the head called out. And then a couple of days later, she hadn't gone far when she heard the messenger's horn. It was down near the palace and she ignored it at first, but it kept getting closer. She picked up her pace. She was no more than 10 minutes away from home. She passed another head and it said, always a treat, Eleanor. And she drew in a breath. The siren kept coming. She was walking faster now, but as the noise got closer, she turned to see where it was headed. It was coming towards her, straight towards her, but surely it was going to turn and go after someone else. She began to run and people all around her stopped and watched. Some of them pointed, all of them were interested. The van cut in front of her, pulled over and stopped. She turned and ran a different way, but the doors popped open and four men jumped out and caught up with her so easily that she was ashamed of herself. Really? She couldn't run any faster than that? Two on each side grabbed an arm and pulled her forward. The other two formed a wall behind her. People everywhere murmured and pointed, but this might be one of those messengers with prizes, so there was no need for alarm. It could be good. It was almost always good. She was pushed inside and the door slammed shut and the men guided her into a rather comfortable seat. There was light. The men nodded at her as if they wanted to reassure her. It'll be all right, one of them said. The president's a decent man. He'll help you. I don't need help. That's right, another man said, scoffing. You're doing just fine. Well, I am, she said. That's why you're here, the third man said. Were they a skit? Because everything you've done is perfect. She clenched her jaw. I demand to see my lawyer, she said. The first man sighed. All these New Yorkers, he said, they all have lawyers. At that, she realized she wasn't just in a different state, but in a different nation. And she didn't know the rules here. Thank you.
Vai. Tell you that when I first started reading it, that my first reaction was that I wanted to strangle Stan. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he, uh, the, he's simultaneously funny as hell, but so obnoxious. And you know, and I, you know, everyone knows people like him. Yeah, yeah. There's a reason why they are originally coworkers. I think as we go through our jobs in life, we come across certain irritating coworkers that sort of stand out. And this is not exactly someone I work with, but he's a sort of composite of, of various coworkers I've had over the years. And it's uh, really easy to pick and choose and assemble one sort of illustrative example. Yeah, and you don't really don't want to. I mean, I don't can't think of anybody who I'd want to say, hi, you know, you're Stan, no. <laughs> um, especially if they read the novel. Um, now, Earlier, you mentioned that um, there are a lot of allusions to other literary works in the book, and you and you mentioned the Master and Margarita as being as being a major one. Are there other? Um, I th I always think of uh, the president as the Wizard of Oz, the man behind the curtain, because he's manipulating things, but he has no real powers of his own. All he can do is bluff his way, and the you know the big bluff. Uh, reminds me again of, of political issues. Um, certainly the presidential heads, uh, Jim, I, I think I mentioned this before to Jim. I was fascinated years ago when I read the story that Philip, some student had made uh, an animatronic version of Philip K. Dick, whom mm -hmm. I love, um, and it was transported by plane. The head, for some reason, was sent separate from the body. And in the course of traveling, the head disappeared. And it, it was picked up for a while. It, it was left in the airplane, the, air, the airline located it. But in the course of trying to get the head and the body together again, the body arrived and the head never did. So all these years I've been thinking about those animatronic Philip K. Dick heads still talking, you know, and predicting <laughs> <laughs> and, going, and going about the business of being Philip K. Dick. This just seemed like such a, you know, it, it's such an interesting possibility to me that oh well, you know, if there were lots of heads, that would be even more interesting. So uh, I sort of lifted that and changed it as you know, sort of insidious surveillance state, always wanting to reach out and ask if there's anyone you want to turn in, you know, and do you want to contribute? So that's where that came from. Alice in Wonderland a little bit, somewhere, mm -hmm. I forget where. Uh, I can never remember all of them, but they're, well, Ch I mentioned Chandler Clang Smith's uh, novel, and Chandler is one of the witches, so there's a little nod there. Um, I decided to go for it. I mean, I'm, I can recognize all of these allusions, and there was a time, I don't know whether this happened, Years ago, when I thought that you know we had every every sentence, every plot line, every character that we wrote had to be completely unique, the mm -hmm. first one ever, you know. And now I'm thinking, you know, it's just like going through life. You don't separate yourself from your experiences. You don't separate yourself from mingling with other people. All this just sort of merges to make you the person you are. And I thought that's true for books as well. What we read, and especially what impresses us. Um, becomes part of a whole body of writing of books and that I have no doubt that we can use and reinterpret everything, anything that's been written before and incorporate it and make it ours. So I think this is the most blatant I've ever been in uh, using things that have interested me in other writing. Uh, and I think it's a good thing. I think it just, you know, makes makes the body of writing more robust to be able to do that and not say, no, I can't use that. I'm I'm not I'm not good enough to steal from this person, you know. <laughs> so I, I do that. Cool. Um, well, we have a a question from from Vaughn Hansen, 
who says, um, Karen, who is your favorite character to write in The Splendid City? I, I think everyone's favorite character has got to be Stan the Cat. He is obnoxious. He's also funny, funny, funny. He says inappropriate things. He gets away with it. And I don't know about you, but every time I say something inappropriate, I, it's wrong. It's wrong, and I have to face the consequences, whereas Stan never, ever, ever faces consequences. So if you could go through life saying whatever struck you, you know, whatever popped into your head, no matter how offensive it was, if you could go through life doing that, you'd be Stan, um, because there are no consequences for Stan. That's just the way he's one of those gifted individuals that the universe allows to exist. Um, and who never gets punished for it. So he was a lot of fun to write. And you know, over the years too, Barbara, you, you've probably heard this whole business of the character ran away with a book or whatever. And I've never, I mean, we calculate our characters. We think about our characters. Um, and the reason Stan is, Stan was so fun to write that of course he's my favorite character, uh, even though I'm more like Eleanor. But he was just fun, you know. He amused me, so of course I'd want to keep on writing Stan. Um, I want to say Eleanor because I'm, you know, I'm cheering on Eleanor. I'm like Eleanor, as I said. But Stan was the fun one. <laughs> <laughs> and what what I love what I love about him is that you know, the, he becomes a cat, but he is so he remains so Stan, but he can't resist a box. I know, it's, I know. It's just it, wonderful. He forgets sometimes that he is a cat at the same time that he's always using it. It's just like he's so superior um, that something like the box is just perfect for him because he can't resist us. It's great. <laughs> now, the head, the whole thing with the heads is very weird to me. I mean, aside from the Philip K. Dick reference, um, because on the one hand, it's as funny as the rest of the novel. On the other hand, it's very, very scary. I mean, you have s these heads prompting people to give up their friends or neighbors yeah. in order to help them. Um, how did you, I mean, yes, how did you um, finally come up with, with, with that idea? I mean, it really is a frightening sort of concept. Uh, it's just one of those things that pop out. I mean, when you know as a writer too that once you start a sentence the sentence could go any anywhere but then you choose the next word and you've now narrowed down where that sentence could go and each time you make a selection it narrows down so inevitably what happens when you have a talking head who's inviting you to participate it it narrows down to can this be good can this possibly be good this doesn't seem like the right thing um, and it gets more and more insidious just because you've taken the first step there without knowing it. Um, this, the heads actually did not seem all that sinister to me at first. It's just over time, um, they become increasingly problematic because, yeah, mm -hmm. turn in your neighbor. Sure, help them out. <laughs> <laughs> and and I really like the way the president, who who is, in essence, one of the bad guys of the thing. He's 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 also he's nice. People like him. He thinks he's nice. I think, um, you know, he's he's not a snarling bad guy. He's doing what's best for him, and so it must be best for everybody else. He's um, a, you know he's a, it's a little odd that he's not worse than he is, but on the other hand, people who don't do the right thing just by with you know withholding passive um what am i trying to say it's just he doesn't seem to be out there on the streets doing anything terrible and he isn't but the machinery is set up to do it for him mm -hmm, so that he mm -hmm. personally uh is not taking responsibility for anything he's taking all the credit because he's you know all of this machine machinery is making people happy. And as long as the people are happy, uh, he can do whatever he wants. So it, it seems like a, an easy win for him. And it apparently is an easy win just to keep pleasing the people. Um, yeah, Amy mentions that that the whole idea of the heads makes her think of 
Jeremy Bentham, ben, sorry, Bentham, who invented the idea of the panopticon. His head is preserved at University College London, she says. It's on display, or at least it was 30 years ago, next to a wax image of him. His real head? Amy, his real head is preserved? Um, I'm waiting for her to <laughs> answer. But uh, yes, that's oh, that just, says. That's just. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Why? <laughs> Why would you do that? <laughs> oh, my God. She says that I went to UCL and you could just see it in the main building. Um, and she thinks he asked for, for it to be preserved. Oh, so cool. that makes who it, knows? That makes it all right then. <laughs> <laughs> But um, anyways, getting away from the heads for a moment. So you have all these people um, who are willing to, who are happy. I mean, they get candy, they get parades. Of course, there's a vast water shortage. They have to pay for their water. Uh, and But they're willing to, also willing to place blame no matter how illogically mm -hmm. and allow themselves on whoever somebody says the blame should be placed and allow themselves to be distracted. On the one hand, again, it's funny, but it's a very um, unhappy look at how people react. Well, we have the same disparity uh, in our own society. I mean, if you're well off enough to afford the things that make your life comfortable, then yeah, you may complain about how high the price of gas is, but you don't need, um, you can manage it. People who are at a much lower income level, it's a real life or death issue when prices get up that high. And it, it's the same thing for water. I mean, if you're well off, you can complain about the price of water, but if you could pay for it, it becomes almost a non-issue. Um, it's the people who get taken away by the van that I think probably have the biggest issue with the water because if you don't have the money to pay for it, you just don't get it. And um, although, right, there's supposed to be a couple of free places, if I remember correctly. Um, but it's just, it, it's the same sort of thing. If we can keep you happy, you will put up with an awful lot that you wouldn't otherwise. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, so the price of water goes up. Yeah, complain about it. But if you can afford it, how much of an issue is it? Really? Um, okay, by the way, I just want to remind people that we are open to Q&A. So if anybody has any other questions, just type them into your Facebook or your YouTube comments and uh, we will ask. Um, one thing that I've been, t I apologize for, I've been totally ignoring is the other side is Eleanor's Coven. Yeah, yeah. Um, how did that develop? Uh, I think I was sort of forced into it, actually. Well, there's a witch in, oh, I've got to stop mentioning how much I've uh, taken from the Master and Margarita because it will no longer seem like I did anything. Um, but there's a whole witch thing going on in the Master and Margarita. And a, a, a Margarita is the name of somebody who gets initiated into being a witch. So it seemed very likely that there was going to be a witch. And I actually got a lot of comfort when the whole section on the coven I and mean, she's just being initiated, being, she's just finding that she actually belongs somewhere, um, belongs in a community. And I found that um, interested me an awful lot. Uh, I come from the literary world originally. So I was writing literary fiction for 20 years or something. A lot of it was magic realism, but I real uh, mm -hmm. magic magic realism. But I realized at one point, you know, maybe it's time to skip over the fence uh, into uh, fantasy science fiction. And I found a much more accessible community there. So it was at that point when I jumped the fence that I found more and more people who were like me, who shared uh, the same joy and the kinds of writing that. I found great joy in writing and reading. Um, so it, in a way, in an odd sort of way, it represents, it represents finding community, definitely for her, but it also represented to me 
what it felt like to finally realize there were other people out there who were my tribe. And uh, so in an odd sort of way, Eleanor's uh, invitation to join the coven was a happy thing to write about because, uh, you know, it, I also felt that I was representing the community that I found. Oh, that's for, you know. <laughs> Well, I, I'm going to go, I'm going to ask one or two more questions about that. But before I do, Jonathan Gladstone Gelman asks, "Have you ever have you ever had a cat that you couldn't change back, and <laughs> did they hold it over you for leverage?" I think none of my cats would have wanted to change into anything human. They all had a much more superior sense of themselves than I did, and if I was representative of the human race, I think they were not going to have it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, getting back, one thing I liked about the Coven is that they, you had, they were all individuals and they were not perfect and they were not these mis mysterious and they were not all knowing, but it was basically a community of women, mm -hmm. um, all different and, um, but still a community. And I really, I really liked the way you did that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now you you mentioned one of them was sort of taken after 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 a writer you knew or any others take any others taken after real people or were they just um, I know sometimes I write and somebody is like two or three people smushed together yeah yeah, yeah. oh well uh, I forgot I just remembered yes one of them uh, is definitely referring to a, a member of a book group that I belong to. Um, a nice woman, very nice, uh, but some of her characteristics. Um, and that's, you know, that's the other interesting thing about A, meeting people, and B, being a writer. You know, this whole thing of being able to grab something from a person, a, ma a mannerism, the way they look, the way they hold themselves. Once there was one person I knew who walked through the doorway in a certain way that always um, interested me. So I could put that into a character. And it's just so interesting to pick and choose from real life people and reassemble them uh, in different ways so that you don't, I mean, you don't necessarily have to make things up completely starting from zero because mm -hmm. the availability of these bits and pieces we've noticed as we go through life, it's like having a cardboard box with items you can assemble. Uh, it, it, it's so nice to be able to do that and just think of um, perhaps someone you liked and want to put them in a story um, or perhaps someone you didn't like that you want to get even with, you know, here's your opportunity. Um, now in part, I don't want to give out, give too much away, but in part of the book, you actually have what really amounts to an action scene. Um <laughs> basically having to do with 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 going down a, a river um was it different writing i've never been able to do a good action scene was it different being able you know writing that as opposed to writing the rest of the book it's a lot longer than i started out thinking i was going to write so i must have really felt that i was doing a, a you know well enough with it to continue with it um it's you're right I, I don't really have many action scenes in my writing either. Um, so it's sometimes hard to judge, but it felt like it moved along. You know, oh, absolutely. It felt, it felt like there was a real, just like the river itself pushing, um, pushing us down. So it felt like it was going well. And I think when I reread it, it still seemed okay. You know, so, um, I don't know that I feel a real need for action scenes, but if I did this and it worked well, maybe, maybe, maybe I should. You know? <laughs> um, Amy Goatschlager asks, um, what are the challenges of blending fantastic elements with near future social science fiction? Um, in other words, you, you have what's basically um, a near future social setup. I mean, we all recognize yeah. uh, liberty, but, um, and, but then you have the very fantastic elements of the witchcraft and the magic. So 
What are the challenges there? In, I, I, in, I think the real in, the challenge is actually an interesting question, which is why I stopped to think um, is I do write my stories seem to be one or the other. Generally speaking, they're either science fiction or they're fantasy. Uh, um, so it is, yes, it is interesting to sort of merge the two. And I, I think it felt natural for this story. I'm not sure how often it would feel natural. Um, a lot of my fiction is sort of deals with the unreal or the things that are on the border of reality. And of course, you could say that this is, but it has a different feel, I think, um, than most of my others. I don't know. I, I think it depends on how you envision the setting more than anything else. This setting, it's also a little bit influenced by Philip K. Dick. I think I, think I have to say that, that the influences sort of directed me in a certain way. And I love Philip K. Dick and he's much smarter than I am. Uh, so he could come up with really absolutely incredible plots. Um, but there was a little leftover between the fantasy elements. I really did write this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so as I, th I just think some of my influences burst through the way that I normally write. And together, I think we had um, a good vacation <laughs> or something. <laughs> but I did write it. I did. <laughs> um. I would normally ask this um, for most of yourself, but are you planning to follow up on it? I mean, I love the characters in this so much. Are you planning to do any kind of follow ups on either or either them or the universe they live in? No, and this is actually another interesting question. Um, a couple of times now with novels, I've gotten disgruntled people saying, What do you mean there's <laughs> what do you mean this is a standalone? What are you talking about? <laughs> and it's just like, huh, this is so odd. I don't know whether it's, um, I, I admire people who can write a trilogy or a series or anything like that. And some of the series I, I'm absolutely desperate that I've read and loved. I'm absolutely desperate, desperate for them to continue on forever. But I don't know in, in my makeup, um, whether I could do that. Stan is really fun to write. Eleanor was good to write. I don't know why it wouldn't occur to me to continue with them, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily be against it. But then again, we have to come up with the idea, right? We have to come up with a, the vehicle for those two to continue together or apart, probably apart. Um, so I don't think so. Um, well, that leads into a question that I was go I was going to ho hold for the end, but it leads so naturally. What are you working on now? I just handed off uh, a novel to my agent to send to Angry Robot, so we'll see what they say about that. Um, and I don't know what else I'm doing right now. I just don't know. <laughs> I'm taking time to think about what I'm doing. I'm a Gemini, so I have about 50 starts for stories. Um, and sometimes it takes decades to pick them up, but sometimes the next day it'll suddenly come to me. So whatever happens, happens. Okay. Um, and I am putting out a last call for Q&A if anybody has any questions that they'd like to ask Karen Hewler. Um, state them now or forever hold your peace, at least for this particular session. Um, so K Karen, we've heard some of the influences on the book that you have from, from a variety of authors. Who are the authors these days who are you, you're reading, um, whether they influence you or whether you're just enjoying them? Um, I absolutely adore Jeffrey Ford. Um, lately I've, I've gotten very much into, oh, senior moment, um, Brian Evanson, mm -hmm. wonderful. Um, I just got a short story collection by Bruce McAllister that Ellen Datlow recommended he sent to me. Um, and I, I really loved it. It's, um, I think the sensibilities kind of are close to my sensibilities. So I really appreciated it an awful lot. Um, 
at, you know, our own circle. I love your work. I love Nick Kaufman's work. I'm going to just mention everyone right now. Chandler Klang Smith's work, John C. Foster's work. <laughs> Should I keep going? I mean, there's so many. The, the thing about our current era is there's so many writers now who, I mean, it's such a huge range of writers um, that it's very hard to even mention half the people I really like. Uh, and I should always keep a card with me to remember, you know, N.K. Jemison is absolutely amazing. I love Susan Palwick's stories. Mm. Elmer Arneson is um, just great, you know. And then there's, uh, oh, I'm almost going to get it. I'm almost going to get it. Well, Mary Duria Russell is wonderful. Who's the, the Miles Vorkosigan, the, the whole Vorkosigan saga? Uh, do you know them? Uh, yeah, yeah, and, you yeah. know, I'm not They're remembering wonderful. either. It's science fiction. They're wonderful and a lot of fun. I, I don't know how many there are, 20, 30. <laughs> uh, Amy, Amy, Amy's got it. Lo, uh, Lois no, Lois McMaster-Buchold. I love reading that. It's just like, it's like being able to eat a whole cake and get it. <laughs> you know, it's just like, it's just, she's very good at character. She's very good at plot. It's just, there's just so many wonderful things to read. Okay. Is, and is there anything else that you would like to tell us about, about, about your book and about your, your novel? Um, I, um, I think I covered just about everything. This is probably the only time in my life I will write about politics, even in veiled form. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't think that's my usual mindset. It just, we've been living as such a, a dark fantasy for such a long time here that it just seemed natural to jump into a story based on uh, what we've uh, been experiencing. So probably that's never the, again. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. It's interesting and it's very descriptive. Yes, dark fantasy is, is exactly how I would <laughs> call it too. And I really like the way that the splendid city on the one hand, has some very obvious political um, tags, but on the other hand, as you say, it isn't. It's generalized enough so somebody ten or twenty years from now could could so enjoy it without knowing exactly right. who the reference are. Right. Um, and I'm I'm wondering. I'm hoping that they'll be sitting there going, "My God, something like this couldn't be couldn't be happening." <laughs> We always hope that, and yet it still does. <laughs> it's very yeah. Strange, yeah. Yeah. I, um, in an email th um, back and forth, you mentioned when we were talking about you know some of the things that uh, we could talk about, and you mentioned that one of the things that that are also referenced is 1984 and the McCarthy era, and you know I imagine that back in the 50s during the McCarthy era, they were saying, well, once we get past that, you know, our following generations are never going to fall for this. No, right. no. I mean, we keep surprising ourselves um, with our responses to what actively is in front of our eyes. And it, 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 it always seems like we don't respond quickly enough. So mm -hmm. I don't know how you can respond quickly enough because things don't always move the way they first seem like they're going to move. So I don't know. It's difficult. Yeah. Well, um, I recommend the Splendid City as a way to both uh, reference today's atmosphere and to laugh at it. Um, so thank you very much, Karen Hewler, for this wonderful um, talk. Again, um, we're talking that Karen Hewler is the author of The Splendid City. Um, Coming up, um, we, we don't yet have a confirmed booking for August for, for the news of readings, but our guest on September 6th will be Sarah Langan. Our audience wrangler was Amy Goldschlager. Our producer was Jim Freund. My name is Barbara Krasnoff. And if you wish to help us um, along, you can make donations at paypal.com slash paypalme slash ourwolves. Thanks again to Karen, and I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Thank Good you night. so much, Barbara. Same to you. <laughs>